Life isn't perfect, and neither are we. Nope. But we know how to face our fears. And have some fun. And talk about all the messiest things of life. Like the messiest things. <laughs> get connected to yourself, get connected to others, and get connected to the life right in front of you. This is The Connected Life with Justin and Abby. That's me. That's you. And you. Are you the most adorable person ever right now? so cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <really> cute. <laughs> if you were in the uh recording studio here with us today uh you would be dying laughing <laughs> and it's also so just completely captured by how freaking cute she is oh today abby walked into the office today and she was wearing her hat <laughs> i've never seen her wear a hat she's wearing a hat and then short sleeve shirt and short cut off shorts and then like snow boots. <laughs> <laughs> and she's so friggin' adorable. And like when she walked into the room in the office, I almost went and threw on a couch and made love to her right there. <laughs> but Except... our friend Ruth is with us today. <laughs> Ruth Except... is like, what's happening? I slammed Abby against the wall. I was like, just kissing her. I was like, I love you so much. You were like compelled by love. You mm-hmm. were like overwhelmed with it. I could see love all over your face. Mm-hmm. Your love was about to destroy me. <laughs> Everyone's like, or did he just want to have sex really bad with you? No, no. It was like this it, this overwhelming, like, you're the cutest. You're so cute. Yeah. You're freaking adorable. And I literally can't handle looking at you right now. I'm not even joking. I'm sorry. I just had to like. <laughs> she goes, she goes. And Ruth goes, is she on her period? <laughs> I think she's on her period. <laughs> None of my periods. <laughs> feel so loud. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those days where she's just so super friggin' adorable. I can't even handle it. But yeah, the, <laughs> sorry, everybody. Just, We're going to talk about dating today. <laughs> I'm just crying over here in my chair. Yeah, you goofball. Well, today we brought Ruth back on as Abby cries over there. I'm actually going to try to not look at you because I just want to grab you and just kiss you all over. And then I'm just going to cry the whole time. You goofball. Hi, Ruth. (laughs) Hey, guys. We have our English friend. Are you you sure you don't want to do this later? (laughs) We could like push pause. Uh Uh-huh. I could go get a coffee. <laughs> I don't think. Would like, are we talking thirty or forty-five off? minutes? <laughs> How about I give you a good two hours? <laughs> Perfect. We don't need. We'll two hours. see you in two hours. Um, Ruth has been on before. If you don't, if you uh, you might remember her as the sexy BBC voice. Ooh. Sexy BBC voice. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, we did a podcast with her talking about her journey with uh, masculinity and her father and the journey of healing and yeah. e- even relating to men in a way that was... Um, uh, changing how she related to men changing how she related to men to change the way that she did life and all yeah. kinds of stuff and so if you haven't listened to that uh go back and listen to that yeah because it's so good it's super so good. but the thing is is that we were planning on i'm like pulling myself together that's i'm working on pulling it pull it together abby thring, thring, thring. my microphone's making lots of noises and justin is giving me the don't make the mic make noises look <laughs> i will say it was such an interesting moment when justin pushed her up against the wall and he's like giving her little kisses and i was like oh this is so cute and then abby's face just crumples <laughs> and her bottom lip starts quivering <laughs> she and i'm melt. like what is happening <laughs> Are you happy at this moment? Is this your hormones? What? It was real. <laughs> no, she's doing it again. Uh-huh. Sorry. This is what a day in the life of Hormone McGee is like. <laughs> hey, you pull it together and you do this, okay? Uh, okay, I was saying something. So, um, Ruth, we didn't have enough time last time. Oh, yeah. Okay, great, great, great. <laughs> if they've never listened to the show before they're gonna be like what oh, is dude, this dude, woman what just happened? she's out of control into... she's lost her mind go she listen to our other podcast episodes if you haven't listened to anything else it'll <laughs> make you feel back. safe <laughs> so um ruth is a brilliant communicator and she has gone through so much transformation in her life and i love having her share her story because she's so good at articulating the process that she went on 
that um, we last time she was here, we were actually going to have her talk all the way through how her masculinity journey has affected uh, dating and that her heart posture and dating and, and how dating has gone with her because I think she's been really successful at dating. And so um, we didn't get to that in the last episode. No, but we want to go on the dating journey with you. Dun, 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 Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. Ooh. Yeah. And Ooh. I would just like to remind the listeners that it was revealed when I was last here, that I am in Justin's top five. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's worth mentioning. It's again. worth repeating. <laughs> you made it. Well, that's a great, actually, segue into, um, because you didn't, she wasn't. That is a great segue. That was, segue. You set that up for us. Uh, you did not actually feel drawn or connected to Ruth at all. I, you know, in the beginning. Well, I, I should explain our dynamics. I was Ruth's leader for um three years kind of basically yeah yeah Yeah. um and helped mentor her so everything good that she says here i take credit for absolutely i just wanted to put that out there and then (laughs) we can continue on don't let her do that to you (laughs) don't let her do that to you copyright (laughs) patent (laughs) it's all mine Uh, i know how america works (laughs) uh, (laughs) we will sue you uh you know when i now when ruth first came in uh I, i would to, for lack of better words, let me see if I can use some cooth here. I was repelled by you. <laughs> Savage. Savage. For I lack was, of better words. And it's interesting because I think I understand why adult male authority figures didn't do well with me. Yeah. Like they were probably really repelled, repelled by, by you. Uh-huh. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm a good person. I don't understand. But like my war inside of my soul created such a chasm between me and them that they could feel subconsciously. And that's definitely what I felt like off the bat. I was like, "Ugh, Ruth drain. Uh huh. I don't know that you felt drained. I think you just felt like, yeah, well, I mean, I could feel the war with masculinity inside of her and I'm emotionally intelligent enough to, to, uh, in my journey of healing to know that's what it was. And I was like, man, she has such a war with men. I cannot do it. I can feel the, (laughs) The right, pricklies like, inside of the her. The pricklies. And uh-huh. I, I don't think people talk about this enough, but everybody kind of has, I do not, I don't want to sound hippy dippy, but I am going to sound a little hippy bit. Hippy dippy. Everybody has like a little, like an, a, an energy life force. Like we all have our emotions. Our emotions are tangible and they're going on inside of us. And, and you know this if you grew up in a household because you know when dad was in a bad mood because you could feel it. He didn't right. have to say it. He could be very stoic, but you'd be like, dad is so angry Avoid right him now. at all costs. Uh-huh. Right? Or you would know when mom is super stressed out. Right. Or like I remember. like Not I've, just the signs of her tossing over tables. Right. You, you <laughs> could what mom feel tosses over it. A table, um, and I, like, I remember knowing my mom was suicidal. And I don't remember her telling me she was. Although I, later on all the time she did. But, right. But early on. No. But in the beginning. And so there's this thing where you can go around people. And like some people you'll go around and you'll feel just like peace. There's a woman that I know that I've worked with in this environment. And whenever I'm around her, you can actually just feel her emotional environment inside of her is peace. Yep. And so you just feel that and feel settled every time you get in her space. Yeah. Yeah. And and so everybody kind of has this emotional energy happening inside of them. And the sad thing is most people aren't aware that other people pick up on that. Totally. We all think that it's like a secret. Like... Oh, I have this huge war with men, but they they don't feel any of it. And we don't want to make people overly self-conscious because I have clients like that. They're like, everybody must feel everything. And I'm like, Uh no, it's not that Uh extreme. And people may never consciously be aware of it, but they're reacting to it. So the world around me is reacting to me. 95 to 99 percent of it doesn't know why they are. Yeah, they just are so you don't have to be overly self-conscious about it. Yeah. So you had like men, adult male leaders, you had all of these beliefs that men leaders didn't have time for you without you were a burden, wouldn't care. And that energy showed up with men leaders and they would respond to it. What they probably didn't know. That's what they were responding to. No, they didn't. So when I, uh, met, oversaw all these people on their transformation process, I had a lot of girls that I would say, hey, you have a prickly 
jacket, like a spiky jacket. And I, I try to explain rejection is this thing where like men you, will even talk about it as, yeah, that girl has like F you written across her forehead. <laughs> And and the girls will be like, no, I don't. And I'm like, yes, you do. Totally. Yeah. We have a whole history and a whole emotional belief system that shows up with us to the people around us. So that prickliness you started uh, addressing with women. Yeah. And I'd be like, it's like you're wearing a jacket that has spikes sticking out of it. And you go to hug men and they don't want to <laughs> hug you because they don't want to get stabbed. Uh-huh. But it's not actually because there's something wrong with you. And that's the thing. Most people take it as an identity shame thing like men don't like me or women don't like me or friends don't like me and they think the w- the the person avoiding hugging them is avoiding them because there's something bad about them when in reality it's just self-protection i don't want to get stabbed yeah mm-hmm. and you can take right. the jacket off and it's not rejection of who you actually are how do you take right. this metaphorical jacket off abby <laughs> Zip. <laughs> Zip. You just unzip it. You just take <laughs> it off. Unzip it. Well, that's part of what we even talked about last week was her journey of taking that metaphorical jacket off last week or whenever the last episode was Yeah. Um, with her in it um, because there was a healing process that had to happen in her belief system. So you, when, she, when you met her, you felt her spiky jacket. Yep. Were mm-hmm. you aware of that, Ruth? No idea. So when I would interact with Justin... What's going on inside of my head is, oh my gosh, I wonder what he's thinking about me. I wonder, (laughs) oh my goodness, is he, just smile, say something nice, try to make polite conversation. Okay, let's get out of this interaction as quickly as possible. You're really lost in your head, right? (laughs) Oh, totally lost in my head. Yes. Uh Totally lost in my head. Because I think, I think when you have something like hatred towards the opposite sex, Every interaction that you have becomes really high stakes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every interaction becomes a comment on your worth as a woman or what masculinity thinks about you. Did you have specific fears with me that that we had in our exchanges? It was more just like a generalized Mm. man (laughs) fear. Uh Uh-huh. There was nothing (laughs) aimed directly at Justin. But... um. I will say any man who felt confident, any Mm. man who felt powerful in his own masculinity, any man who wasn't, um, I would say, I would say I found a lot of solace in men who felt a little bit more effeminate or Mm -hmm. a little bit more nurturing. Those felt safer. They felt safer. Yeah. yeah. And why is that? Probably, I think, because it, it there's a familiarity with, like, the feminine is safe, the feminine accepts me, the feminine loves me, masculinity, not sure about that. So any man who felt a little bit more... Feminine. You're like... Feminine. They'll familiar, like me. Yeah. They'll yeah, like me. It, they'll love me. And, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, that's that sounds like a normal for a lot of women. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And Justin was kind of the opposite of that. He was like... Man... <sighs> Yeah. Man, man, <laughs> man, man. But also what was I would say, uh, maybe you wouldn't say this, but I would say uh, the dichotomy is, is that there's the man, man, but then the actual really soft, tender, nurturing. But part you of me come as well. across as a man. You have yeah. all the features of, of the a, feminine men that you. Oh, absolutely. Like, absolutely. He's tender. He's compassionate. He's kind. He's protective. Yeah. Uh, but you have that. Uh, but, but I the have package that. is manly. Manly. Well, and I think package. I think you. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) I think you know we talked a little bit about this before, but whenever you're afraid of something, you're on hyper alert about it. Yeah. Right. So if I would come into contact with men and they have like a strong sense of masculinity or self, I'm way more likely to be paying attention to that side of them than the caring, nurturing side. Yeah, so you miss the caring, nurturing side. Yeah. So all I see when I look at Justin is, oh, he's scary. Yeah. So Uh would you do a quick recap on where you, just a quick recap. Yeah. This is where, what I believed about masculinity, what I believed about my own femininity coming into this journey. Yeah. Um, So just really quickly, my main parental relationship was with my dad so I always felt really comfortable and safe around men when I was 13 he had an affair um, and left the family and it kind of threw this idea of what is masculinity into chaos yeah and are men safe can they be trusted they only want one thing 
Um, it wasn't what like they that? just divorced. It also left a lot of financial stress yeah. on your mom, and you didn't see very much of him. Yeah. So it was a... He kind of checked out. Yeah. It was felt a, like a big <clears throat> bomb of abandonment. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, what does that say about me? Was I enough, like, as a daughter? Was I enough as a woman? Am I beautiful enough? Am I worth staying for? Am I worth fighting for? Introduced all those kind of questions into my life. And the questions of, was my mom enough? Was my mom enough? Am I like her? Yeah. What did she not do that I need to do to make sure that I don't repeat what happened to her? Um, Going on the journey of um, learning how to use my sexuality to be powerful with men, um, to feel in control of that sense of rejection and that fear ultimately coming to the end of that and realizing this is not getting me what I need. It's not getting me what I want. It's actually hurting me more than it's helping me. Um, Beginning to go on the journey of learning how to relate to men out of a sense of self rather than a sense of manipulation. Yeah. Huge. Um, Beginning to confidence. Yeah. uh, Your own identity. Absolutely. Uh Um, Beginning to answer my own questions of, am I, lovely and valuable and worthwhile rather than looking to men to answer it so what about the dating process with her Can yeah we- and let's Tangent. talk about dating dating so let's talk about ooh, um ooh. the last two relationships you've been in and how you postured your heart and what you learned through the process okay well first of all i should say that if you listen to the last episode i described how i basically stopped dating right uh-huh. i checked myself into a nunnery yep <laughs> was in the nunnery, nunnery. Uh-huh. allegorical nunnery just trying to figure out how to even interact with that with men without using sexuality yeah uh, so i didn't date for five years wow 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 <laughs> um which part of that was great part of that was like yeah this is great i need i need to find myself i need to learn how to do this in a healthy way I would then say on the back side of it, I was trying to figure out how to check out of the nunnery. Uh-huh. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like, I don't want to be in here. I, I got to get out. Yes. I don't want to be cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is actually a thing that a lot of girls, women go through. Yeah. Is we can get so kind of internal in our own worlds and in our own um uh, romanticized ideas about what dating is and what men are yeah. that that we get stuck in this ivory tower waiting right. for this prince charming to come and climb up totally. and break you out of there and you're like you know it's been a long time <laughs> I, I, I think i've been in here five years actually. <laughs> <laughs> um so so me starting to date again was kind of the process of Getting out of the nunnery. Yeah. Ripping off that habit. Yeah, Who girl. Needs that habit? I do like this, though, because I think that there's value. And I've met a lot of people who've never not dated. Mm-hmm. And I do think there's a really beautiful value in not dating for a season, getting comfortable with yourself, kind of changing. Like, I know all these people who are serial daters, but they ha- find the same kinds of relationships over and over and over again. And when you actually take time separately, you realize I can like me, I can be whole, I can find out who I am, I can raise my standards. And healing always creates where you have better chance for a, a more evolved kind of love afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what what happened in that dating process? So the first the first guy that I dated after my five year stint in the nunnery. Um, Did you have steps you took to get out of the nunnery? Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, you kind of helped me go on a journey of what does embracing sexy look like yeah. without it being manipulation. Totally. I vividly remember being in an interaction with Abby once and she was like, why are you wearing a potato sack? <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And she made me take this baggy shirt that I had on off. And you had a tank top under. I had a tank top on underneath. Yeah, I wasn't even like naked or anything. No. And I had a full on meltdown. And I was like, holy crap, you have a great body under there. <laughs> I never knew you had a great body. Literally in like the four years up until that point, I was like, I didn't know. Totally. So steps like that. You took me to get my, my hair dyed yeah. for the first time. Just learning how to embrace femininity. femininity, sexiness in a way that didn't feel destructive and manipulative. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's but good. that felt healthy and life giving. Love that. Um, so the first guy that I dated after my five year stint, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it obviously felt really high stakes. Yeah. Because it had been five years. Totally. Oh yeah, you were tripping out. Oh, I was tripping out. Didn't know which way was up or down. Yes. Um, I well, what happened is I'd say you were just probably instantly triggered. Yeah. And once your brain is in the triggered place, you're not, it, you're no longer thinking um, logically. Right. Yeah. You, you're completely tunnel vision. Um, so, so I dated this guy and, and we went on dates for maybe like a month around a, here and about. And um, it felt incredibly high stakes. It felt very, this is the first, this was the first Christian guy I dated actually. Yeah. This was the first guy I had dated where sex was off the table oh, yeah. and sexuality was off the table. Wow. Like, how do I know way that I bond or without... get them to like you? Yeah. yeah. So I felt so vulnerable and completely at sea. And how do I even, how do I even flirt with you? <laughs> how, totally. I remember having I conversations. I just throw you against the wall and make out with you, but that doesn't work in the same way. Yeah, I was having conversations with Abby and she was like, you should just text him and be flirty. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that <laughs> without. It's sending a boob pic. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I think I'm flirting. <laughs> Is this flirting? <laughs> I'll take the sack off. Yes. Um, just feeling completely at sea. Like, what do we even talk about? You know, all of those times I went out for those date on those c- nice, friendly coffee dates with guys to reframe masculinity out the window. Oh, I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, I don't remember any. I of don't it. remember any of it. How do I be myself? I don't know. <laughs> and. Um, I, I just remember this this really old, familiar feeling coming up inside of me of, mm. I need to get you to choose me. Right. I need to get you to want to date me to, I'm not even thinking about, do I like you? No. Yeah. Who cares? Totally. <laughs> uh-huh. Doesn't matter. I'm not even thinking about, am I having a good time? Right. Do we have good conversation? Instantly, my entire goal is, I need you to get to choose me. Yes. I need you to think that I'm beautiful, that I'm sexy, that I'm that you whatever. Want me, that, that you want I'm me. funny, that I'm the best, yeah. that I'm intelligent, that uh-huh. I'm delightful. Uh-huh. It was such a crazy reflex. Oh, yeah. And I'd say this feels very normal for a lot of people, men and women. Uh, It's one of the number one things that I counsel people in in dating when I'm like, wait, do you know if you like them? Like, do you have questions about like if they're a good fit for you or not? And like 90 percent of the time. No, I feel like I remember you you pushing that back on her really hard. on Yeah. Like, how do you do you why do you even like him what, right. what's going on like, do you know if you like him or is this just i want to win the game totally and if i win the game that means something about who i am totally. it's called it's shame dating yeah i yeah. think you can fix my identity yeah and it's interesting because like like you said you did a lot of work prior to that and now that work's gone out the window <laughs> because you're in a triggered state <laughs> But the thing is, a lot of people would be like, oh, that's wasted then. I failed this round. But no, it's a practical, the practical implementation of the healing process yep. when we yeah. actually get in circumstances. We can't judge these first few circumstances after we've been working hard on stuff, it, whether it's in the dating area or it's other pieces of our life. We have to go, no, this is progressive. Yeah. Now I have to apply it to the parts of myself that are triggered in a practical way. Yeah. And I'm going to have to walk through that journey. And it's successful that I'm even willing to face it. I'm not failing because totally. it's easy for a lot of people to be like, nope, I did some work. I just failed immediately when I got into that connection. I tried wooing this person again and totally just have grace for yourself is what totally. I'm saying. Absolutely. Yes. It's, it's learning. I mean, we can like, there's a difference between theoretically working yes. through something and then, and then emotionally it. living in this space yep. where it's happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I had done a lot of like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Theoretical. Theoretical which was great and powerful and and I needed that. Yeah. Because then when I was occupying the emotional space, I had somewhere to put the breakthrough. Yeah. yeah. I had the theory behind it to be like, "Oh yeah, well this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. This my self-awareness kicked in." Yeah. Whereas when I was dating before, there was no self-awareness. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Big deal. Absolutely. Big deal. So, so you're really triggered. 
So I'm really triggered. My entire goal in this relationship is to get him to keep choosing me. Totally. Which <laughs> not a so, good goal. Not a good goal. And that means that every date is high stakes. It means after every date, I'm waiting either for the How hammer to fall uh, or uh-huh. for success is to happen. Is he going to text me? What is he going to say about me? me? He uh-huh. didn't. What does that mean? Yeah. Uh-huh. Every every interaction is is high stakes. I can't even enjoy yeah. right. the like, exchange. Did I say the right thing in this yeah. text? Did I text too much? Did I text too little? It's like right back to being in your head. Should I call him yeah. now? Should I not call yeah. him? Absolutely. Which has a little bit of des- like the energy with that is, is desperation. The motion with that is desperation Absolutely. and fear, not comfortability. It's like a natural yeah. bug repellent for humans. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> date repellent. <laughs> date repellent. Yes. Desperation. Natural odor is of desperation. Date uh-huh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's perfect. That's funny. So we, we probably went on dates for around about a month and then, um, uh, he ended up pulling me aside and having a conversation with me, you know, that dreaded conversation of, you know, we've been going on dates for a month now. Like, let's kind of figure out if we want to keep doing this or, or we don't want to keep doing this. And I was like, I want to keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to win. Uh-huh. I want to win. Totally. Um, and he turned around and said, you know, I really enjoyed you, but I'm, I'm done. Yeah. I'm, I'm done doing this. Good on him. That's good, mm-hmm. straightforward yeah. communication. Yeah. Way to reject you. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although kind of like, why not jokes, just tell jokes. you? And why ask you? And it doesn't matter. But. It doesn't matter. But let's not a get A better into way specifics. to have done it would have been <laughs> just to tell you where he was at instead of making you share and then. Yes, a better way might have been to lead. Yes. And say, hey, this I is just have to let you know. I'm rather not actually than feeling this. Make right me now. be vulnerable. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's horrible. Uh-huh. Anyway, I'm gonna punch him. Anyway. So so he says he doesn't want to date anymore. I all of a sudden have this cataclysmic explosion happen inside of me. Mm. All of my worst fears have come true. Yes. I'm not worth choosing. Mm-hmm. I'm not beautiful. I'm not worth dating. No man is ever going to choose me. Right. I'm never going to get married. I'm going to be alone forever. Where are my cats? <laughs> uh, this is so real with people. This is what happens. They get rejected and they broadcast that rejection to their entire future and their entire identity. Right. This is how it's always going to be. No man's going to ever want me. Like, exactly. Right. Yeah. Which is the nature of high stakes. Yep. So something isn't about just one date with a guy. It's right. become a comment about my entire life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember, you know, going, what came around to Abby and, cried on her lap and actually whimper cried I don't oh, know if yeah. any of you she have ever whimper cried we are crying did. so hard <laughs> that noise involuntarily comes out <laughs> and not a nice noise <laughs> kind of a <laughs> <laughs> I'm I've I've been there. You actually. whimper cried. Not gonna lie. Yeah. Let me expose that. Your whimper cry sounds more like a, a whale. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you're whimper crying. So I'm whimper crying. I'm I'm basically feeling all the pain of my past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you're and this is what lots of people that. don't notice. They think it's about that moment. Right. And then that it's makes not, you feel crazy. Yeah. Right. It's about the fear that you've carried your whole life. Right. It's about the rejection and the abandonment that you've carried your whole life. Right. It's all of that pain coming up to the surface again. Yeah. And and me feeling it and grieving it and, and, and actually in that moment saying, you know what, this doesn't get to define me. Absolutely. This isn't true. The truth that's happening in this scenario is actually one guy said, hey, I don't want to go on more dates with you. Yes. What didn't happen in this scenario is one guy said, you're never going to get married. Totally. No man is ever going to choose totally. you. You're going to die alone. <laughs> totally. Which is completely what it felt like to yes. me. Yes. In that moment, because I had given him the power. So much power. To, to say that or to not say that. Yep. And it, it was a real great moment for me to just remember. This is what I'm saying about the space we live in and the theory. It was a really great moment for me to be like, oh, I just I did that again. Mm-hmm. I gave him the power to say whether I'm lovable or not lovable. Yep. Yes. This became about that yep. rather than it being about what did I enjoy? Are we a good fit for each other? Mm-hmm. Um, are we compatible? Are we compatible? It was not, compatibility was not the question. No. 
It was, am I worthy? Yes. And that will always create pain in dating. So tell us about how you emotional after you get all triggered and he breaks up with you, how did you process through all of that after your whimper cry? <laughs> the whimper cry. Um, I processed with a bunch of different people who were in my life. So my best friends, uh, some of those father figures that I was talking about and mother figures that I have in my life. Um, I went to see my counselor. I remember coming out of the counseling session um, where I described the interaction and how I felt and, um, and just having this moment where I was like, oh, you know what? I need to take back my power. Mm. I need to be the one who tells myself that I'm worthy of love again and that I'm the one who, you know. Um, so I went straight from my counseling appointment and went and got a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. I get tattoos and monuments everywhere. And now I've never everywhere. had a tattoo before. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. This was my first tattoo. But it felt like this great moment. Did of, you have like an aha in that counseling session? Yeah. I was like, oh, I, I did it again. Mm-hmm. I gave away the power to say that I'm lovable and choosable to this guy and really that power should be mine. Was it a butterfly on your lower back? Yeah, it was a tramp stamp. (laughs) (laughs) I thought, I know what I need. I need a tramp stamp. (laughs) I need a tramp stamp. I'll lure you with this tramp stamp. (laughs) And, but it was this really powerful moment and, Mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of think that's what processing and healing is about. It's, it's about the talking and then it's about just doing something yeah it's about taking action and and even just in taking that action it felt like I'm gonna make this decision about my life and about myself and if I say that I want this then that's enough well I'm just gonna tell everyone else that it's worth choosing and that is something like normally you would have asked people like do you think a tattoo is a good idea do you think I should do it do you think this looks pretty do you think this is beautiful do you think this is ugly like right you would have wanted what and you're a three on the Enneagram I'm a three which means you care so much what other people (laughs) think of you and so the idea was I'm gonna get a tattoo without asking people what they think just because I like it right I'm gonna choose something because I want it. Right. And I don't even care. I don't even care if you like it. I don't even care if you think it looks cool. That's not the point. And I even think that now when I look down at it, I'm like, yeah, it's not the best tattoo in the world, but I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) I chose it. It was my decision. I get to tell you that it's worth being on my body. And what Uh does it say? It says, she who is brave is free. Mm. I love that. And why'd you pick that? Because that felt like a real... A philosophy that I had started to live my life by. Mm-hmm. If I can at least choose bravery, mm-hmm. I know I will always be freer in my life. Love that. Mm-hmm. Super good. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of uh, talking with people, a lot of um, taking, going back into moments that I'd had with the guy and reframing it with my new truth that I knew about men and masculinity. And 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 honestly, it, it was a lot of taking ownership mm-hmm. over what I had done rather Your than triggers. villainizing him. Yeah. And saying, oh, well, this guy, blah, blah, blah. He just couldn't see how great I was. Or totally. this All guy. All this crazy blame yeah, to survive it. Only to wanted to date a shame. supermodel. Right. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> unrealistic uh-huh. yes. and just taking ownership of yeah but I was trying to manipulate him mm-hmm. I was trying to get my needs met I was trying to get my question answered I was so good. and and looking at that through the lens of reality instead of the lens of delusion oh yeah I like mm-hmm. that I yeah I think a lot of people people quit ownership, looking through the lens of delusion ownership it's a pretty lens feels though. scary mm-hmm. And so they don't want the shame of that. So they'd rather blame. Yeah. But actually it liberates you from shame yep. to take ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I think if you can take ownership, that's where you can have compassion on yourself. Mm-hmm. If you if you take the delusion lens off, I can I can look at myself and I can say, Oh Ruth, there's still places inside of you where that pain feels so real. Yeah. That pain of your dad leaving feels so real. That pain yes. of not feeling chosen and protected by men feels so real. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. The truth is you don't need to manipulate to get that need met. So you were able to not only recognize, oh, I was controlling and manipulating, trying to get my question answered, 
then you were able to have compassion on why. Yes. So you don't like hate yourself like, man, I'm never going to get a husband until I figure my crap out. Right. It was. Right. I can see you. I can see why this showed up. Right. And I, and I think in being able to do that is where we can take value out of the dating process so that the only value in dating isn't, was this successful or not? Did we get married? Did we, right. which I think we can have a tendency to look at things that way. Yeah. I was able to look at it and be like, what a great learning experience that was for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I realized that there's still this deep reflex inside of me. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm so happy and thankful that I got to go on that journey with that guy and that he helped me get in touch with a side of my heart that, yes. you know, I actually couldn't access without dating. Yes. I couldn't That's access good. without a guy look at it. in that emotional space with me. And, you know, that's how I look back on it now. And I, I just feel really thankful for the experience. And I knew that I, I grew I grew, and I learned some more about myself. And, and I take that and I move forward. Yeah. And that feels like, to me, the goal I try to set people up with right. in dating. That you can actually learn about you. You can go on your healing process. Right. Regardless of how they behave, it is going to evoke things in you that you can get free from. Right. And, and I think coming out of that experience... Um, I started to have this this idea that you and I had talked about, which is, well, what if I just learned how to do dating really shame-free? Yes. What if dating no longer became, because shame is attached to our identity, mm-hmm. what if dating no longer was a comment on my identity, yes. but a shame-free process of figuring out, do I like this person? Mm-hmm. Do I enjoy being around this person? And if it doesn't work out, great. Yep. It actually means I know more about myself. It means that I'm moving closer towards finding out what is a really good fit for me. Absolutely. Rather than death and destruction. And so how did this then begin to play the role into your future relation, into dating your relationship? Next relationship. Your next relationship. Yeah. So my next relationship, um, so I dated this guy for maybe like nine months mm-hmm. total. So it was a longer, yeah, a longer, longer relationship. We kind of got past the dates awkward stage stage. yeah and we were actually in um a relationship and uh, you know i kind of went into it very much with that that learning point from the other relationship fresh in my mind this is not about getting him to choose me yeah this is not about me proving to myself that Mm. i'm worth worth loving this is i my goal in this relationship should just be to figure out if we're a good fit, mm-hmm. do I like things about him? Do I like him enough to be in relationship with him? What does he like about me? Yeah. Um, which felt like a way lower stakes yes. approach into relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so so we, we started dating. Um, I think... Um, in this relationship it was the it was the first time I remember having this epiphany like this is the first time I really understood what connection was (laughs) really (laughs) totally Totally. what about it why in the sense of like because you'd never had emotional connection no relationships before any of my boyfriends that I had dated before I couldn't tell you what emotional connection was I didn't Uh even know what I what wasn't my goal. My goal totally. wasn't emotional connection. Uh-huh. My goal was keep them around. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Because all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is what the word connection means. Right. Like you can hear about it from people, but then when you get into it, right, it's something to be really felt to be understood. I'm like, all. oh my gosh, this is this almost this third thing in the relationship with us is our connection. Yeah. And is it strong or is it not strong or is it how are we growing it? How are we developing it? Mm. And and just having no concept of that even being a thing and and how do you grow it and how do you make it strong and and what weakens it and what doesn't and um so it really started to be this this journey of if you can get past the the high stakes of am I being chosen to then well how do I even grow intimacy with someone yes and how do I even know if I like the intimacy that I'm growing with Which is somebody? powerful, right? Um, yeah, so powerful. And, and, and I remember people challenging me, Abby challenging me and saying, well, what's your goal for this relationship? How do you, how do you want to grow it? Did like, that just give you a meltdown? <laughs> yeah. What intentional conversations are you having? And I was like, what do you mean intentional conversations? 
You just have conversation. Uh-huh. <laughs> you Nobody just ride the waves of uh-huh. conversation. <laughs> and see where it takes you. <laughs> and see where it takes you. Worked for me in the past. Well, I guess it didn't, but... Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and, and, and learning how to even be intentional in that. Well, what do we want to talk about? Like, what do I want to know about him? Yeah. What do I want him to know about me? What are those topics of conversation? Um being able to navigate through um, learning how to be vulnerable with him. Yeah. I had never even let a guy, I had never intentionally let a guy vulnerably emotionally affect me. Right. They had hurt me emotionally. Yeah. But I had never intentionally lowered my walls in the context of a romantic relationship and let his love affect me Mm. the way that I'd been learning to do with my guy friends. Right. Um, And, and realizing how scary that was and how vulnerable that was. And, and it took, it took a few, a few goes at it for me actually even to be able to do it. Yeah. I remember the first time I did it, it was over text. Uh Uh-huh. He likes was affir- he was affirming me uh-huh. over text. He was saying something actually about my dad and about men and masculinity, and and I just started. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry. Oh my gosh, I'm crying. <laughs> He's affecting me. <laughs> I'm not a robot. <laughs> I'm not a robot. The Tin Woman has a heart. <laughs> and um, and then and then the next time it being over Skype. Um, I was having a conversation about something that was uh, scary for me and, and hard for me and, and me crying. And um, and then finally in person being able to cry yeah. in front of him and let his love affect me and let him comfort me and let him Did that feel terrifying in that oh, moment? Oh, terrifying. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Terrifying. I never felt so naked, vulnerable, well here's the interesting thing that i want to point out about dating is you are actually a master at everything you just mentioned you're really intentional in relationships you're really good at being vulnerable you're really good at being affectable and receiving love all of those things you're great at and i i want to explain this because this happens with most people they are a boss at life and then they show up completely different in dating totally because dating we have our we're the, our most triggered, our most protected, our most take care of yourself self. You have the most, so you, your kid brain, so when we are triggered, when we have emotions from the past, beliefs from the past that are coming up, we actually then are having our kid brain lead us. Right. And so while you're an expert at all those things, I mean, you teach those things. Totally. Two people. Totally. Because you're so good at them. Totally. But then in dating, it's like you have to start at a, from ground zero to build that skill. Mm-hmm. It was a very humbling experience. <laughs> As you're going into Meltdown City. Why can't I do this here? What's wrong with me? And I realized how little I knew. Yeah. I mean, I knew it theoretically, but in an emotional present space inside of me i didn't know anything and this is a real good point i know justin's gonna be like quit talking let ruth continue but i just want to say that we can logically know things but when we trigger it's our emotional self showing up right and our emotional self is not as advanced as our logical right. self and that can make us feel crazy and a lot of people have shame because they're like i know better than to let a guy treat me like this right but i'm still showing up doing this right Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so go, going on that journey of learning how to be vulnerable with him, learning how to affect him, let him affect me. Um, and also going on the journey of learning how to have a voice in the relationship. Yeah. And uh, whereas where I'd come from before was a very like, yes oriented whatever you want yes totally oh gosh, yes i love that too <laughs> i can't tell you how many horror films i watched with boyfriends <laughs> oh my god just because want they to wanted watch. to watch them and, and i didn't yeah, want I'm to totally into it and i was like oh yeah <laughs> now i'm scarred and traumatized <laughs> 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 um so even learning how to have a voice and mm-hmm. say actually you know what i don't want to do that or um, I need some alone time. I need to not see you right now. Hey, that was really hard for me when you said that thing. That actually didn't feel really good to me. 
and and again that felt intensely vulnerable that felt like yes. super challenging yeah standing in a space where i'm not manipulating the situation mm-hmm. i'm just coming uh-huh. at it openly and honestly and 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 no no defensive walls up to protect yourself if they say they disagree right they argue you know right. now you have to just be like all right i have to be on the journey of like maybe they won't respect that and i have to move forward further with my words and be challenged to have even more of a voice on something right right and i think of it boundaries and being yourself being honest in a relationship is like a a part of self love it felt like you loved yourself in a whole new way by being honest. Yeah, it felt, I mean, it felt like me being in control of my power. Yeah. It felt like me being, me saying to him, I choose me. Yeah. I hope that you, I, it would be lovely if you chose me too. Yeah. But if not, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, kind of getting to go on that journey for the first time, um, even in that space, f- having the the presence of mind to think through, what do I like about this guy? What don't I like about this guy? What feels good to me about this relationship? What doesn't feel good to me about this relationship? Which you've never which done Which I've never before. done before. My, when your whole goal is, I need you to choose me. Yep. I need you to not leave me. I need you to not cheat on me or... I need to figure out how to cheat on you before you cheat on me. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it w- was new to me. And, and you know, and I very quickly realized I don't know what I like. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I started to, I started to pick up things that, oh, it, you know what? It actually really affects me when a guy is good at validating. Yeah. That's really wow. great for my heart when a guy can verbally validate what I'm going through and and with love and compassion, that's actually really powerful to me. That feels like a, a really important part of love that my heart likes to thrive in. So you right. found it, you're able to, as you're doing it and you're not trying to play the game, you're learning about yourself. And even yeah. that, you're like, oh, I found that I have a value for this. Yeah. And I need to be able to have that inside of a relationship yeah. where someone has a capacity at some level. Again, yeah. again, not that they're my source of anything, but that right. they have the capacity to engage in this way. Otherwise, it's not going to do well for me. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. and even learning, you know, there were there were certain things that I thought would be super important to me mm-hmm. that actually turned out to be not as important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Really irrelevant. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, oh I would love if they were as emotionally intelligent as me. Yeah. Actually, didn't matter. Totally. Yeah. You know, I can go get that need met elsewhere. I can I can bring that to the table in the relationship. Right. And strength. He can yeah. bring something else. Um, so you learn, and I would say from watching you, there's some things that he did really well that you learned, I need this because this is feeling amazing. Right. And then other things that you're like, oh, it, I'm missing this and I really need this. Yeah. And this is kind of the process of dating. Like yep. exactly what you're saying is when we can be present enough, when we cannot be triggered and when we cannot be trying to get them to win, yep. we end up being able to choose. Yep. And that is a really healthy place. So you learned about yourself yep. and ultimately ended up choosing that it wasn't the right fit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th- I think even, even learning, even learning it and being able to be honest with myself about things that, that didn't feel good to me. Right. Hey, actually, I don't super love the way that you do conflict. Right. That actually, that's, I'm never going to thrive in that scenario. Totally. I'm not saying you're bad. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying you need to change. I'm just saying. Our compatibility. Our compatibility is not, not great in this area. Yeah. And, and that would have been a space before where I would have just not acknowledged it. Like, mm. And be like, well, I have to figure out how to deal Just with this. Get past it and, and get deal past with it, it. And ignore it. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. ultimately, the relationship ended, but you learned how to value yourself. Yeah. You learned how to be honest. You learned how to have a voice. Yeah. You learned how to be vulnerable. You learned how to fight for connection. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was the first, to me, it felt like. I ended up ending that relationship, but it was the first time that I ended a relationship out of choice, mm. not out of reaction. 
huge really out of reaction of my fear, fear of intimacy. That's it, massively. It was, I was in the relationship long enough and gathered enough information and, and let myself be open and, and affectable enough to the point where I was like, yeah, I mean, this is great. You're a great guy, but this is just not I've collected the enough right data that yeah. I know that this will not work. Yeah. And it, and it and it wasn't a comment on my future. It wasn't no. when I when I had processed through so much of that pain and desperation and um, I'm not going to be OK if this doesn't work out. It means that I can make that decision without that fear clouding the, the, the judgment of that. And what I like is it's um, it's it's getting clear on this is what I do don't want yeah and i'm about a million steps closer to what i do want yeah absolutely because very rarely do people know what they don't want yeah because again they aren't connected to themselves they haven't absolutely. stopped everything. so it's uh, people would be like oh, i just wasted nine months not if you did it like this yeah right. you actually right. threw yourself completely forward and stopped yourself from wasting another 10 years of life playing yeah. the game, going in cycles and circles, yep. but you got present enough with yourself for that nine months to go, oh, I'm getting clarity. Yep. And clarity is one of the biggest gifts ever because people um, will come to me and they'll go, am I making the right decision by marrying this person? And really it all comes down to, I don't know, have you taken enough time in this process to get clear on what you want and what you don't want and what you are choosing into and what your heart feels? Yeah. Because you know, I, I know there are, there are couples that'll go through a divorce process and they're like, I didn't even know what I wanted then. And I chose into it and I'm just stuck in this marriage that I never actually wanted. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a cluster of a mess to deal with right now. Totally. But it, but those are the regrets that happen for so many people. And so if we just up front go, I'm not going to have all the answers. I mean, Abby and I got into the relationship. We didn't know we didn't everything know, we, we wanted. We didn't even know a little bit. Of, I mean, <laughs> why knew a little bit? That's not true. We knew a, there was a there was a. Bit. I had a good handful of information inside of my soul of what I did want. Yeah. Um. And what I did need. Oh, that's true. I meant I didn't know everything about you. No, but I didn't know everything about you. But we did know the we core values. We knew enough at core values and knew enough about ourselves, what we did want, that that has been an anchor point for yeah. the success that we've had in our relationship. Because in the moments where we wanted to light fire to each other and, you know, like... <laughs> burn the bridges and walk away from each other. I mean, walking away doesn't necessarily have to be divorced, but it's just like, you can't, you're having so much pain or frustration. You're able to go back to the anchor point of, yeah, but I knew why I chose you and I chose yep. you for these reasons. And I'm happily going to continue to choose you even through this portion of the process. I'm not feeling caught off guard. Like I just stumbled into something. And again, that's another uh, reason like people have fear because they're like, is it a roll of the dice? And again, it doesn't have to be a roll of the right. dice. Doesn't right. mean there won't be some surprises along the way, though. And this is why I say, like, really the one thing you need every dating relationship you need is to make sure that you and your partner are both open to counseling. Right. Like, that's the yeah. number. Not even open, but both of you are willing to pay the price for it. Like, actually, emotionally, but also money-wise, that you're both willing to to actually go after it. Cause there's a lot of things that you're going to get into relationship that are going to be triggered. You're going to be triggered forever. That's the beautiful thing about relationship. It helps you become right. But you want somebody that you and them are willing to actually fight for that. So whether or not you chose well and you're married now and you're like, I didn't know what I wanted. It's okay. Cause you can actually still go after the healing process and yep. become whole. This yep. woman named Esther Peril, she's a psychologist or she's a psychotherapist or, or doctor of something. But she says you everybody is married to three to four people in their lifetime. Just some people, it's to the same person. So like that's a good way to put and it. And I would say like I think we're on our second marriage, me and you. Uh huh. Because with each other. Yeah, because I think we've so transformed, and so even if you didn't get to choose originally. You have the power now to go after healing and, and choose now. And that's good. And, and people need it who are hearing this, like if you are in a marriage and this is describing a scenario for you, 
um, there's an invitation. Yeah. There's an invitation for both partners. Like right now, who do we want to become and do we want to find value for the healing process? Mm-hmm. And and right. that it, it, just saying yes to that invitation begins to put a lot of beautiful things into motion. Yeah. And um, I, would, I would even say it, w- what you're describing is people feeling powerful in relationships where, yep. where power comes from is choice. Yes. Yep. So if I feel like I'm choosing into this, I might be choosing with my eyes wide open that I see all these things that could be difficult for us and that could cause us pain. But if I've chosen into it, then I feel powerful in it and I feel like I have a sense of ownership over it. Yeah. And I think for me, that's kind of where the dating process kicks in is you're learning how to choose. Yeah. Yep. You're learning what you want to choose and what you don't want to choose and you're learning the power and the ownership of choice and does that make sense so good and i just want i want to wrap this up with this but you mentioned this a second ago justin there's all these people that i know they're like i don't want to waste time i i just need to know like they're like i'm already this old i don't want to be in a nine-month relationship that doesn't work out and i think that that is the worst i mean that's poverty mentality and if you start your if your emotions are there to begin with there's no way for that to go well for you. And and the opposite is exactly when I look at you, you are a different person from dating for a year. Mm-hmm. You have more standards. You have more self-worth. You have more self-confidence. You have more needs in just your friendships. You have more boundaries. You have more of a voice. Like you became more of who you were made to be from a nine-month experience. Absolutely. So, If you see dating as this is a growing process, Mm -hmm. this is part of my journey. And I look at you now and I'm like, oh, you're going to be even healthier with the next guy you date. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with me. And every guy I dated, I grew. I learned more about what I wanted and I didn't want. And the next guy I dated, I was able to be more me. I was Mm -hmm. able to have a voice more until Justin when I was able to be the most myself. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so it's a journey and it's a learning experience. And so I, I'm i so thankful that you came on. I think that you share such a good, brilliant um, heart for the, the process of dating, what success in dating is, which is growth um, towards real intimacy and hope for the future. And I'm really well, glad. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. You are welcome. One of my top thanks five. Thanks for having me. <laughs> top five. Top <laughs> Who's the other four? <laughs> I know. Secret. So in this top five, am I fifth? Am I probably number one? I'm gonna let you keep <laughs> guessing. That way, you can always be trying to earn approval to get to like. Yeah. Oh, I see. You're appealing to my three. Yes. Uh-huh. Mm. <laughs> you want to be best? You're gonna have to fight for uh-huh. it. You're gonna rue the day you put that challenge in front of me. <laughs> rue the day. <laughs> you ever rue the day about something? Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, if you've been affected in any way shape or form like we always like to say please rate review subscribe and share um it's really important to us that people just get healing and freedom in their process and anything in here that could bring people further freedom we want to get that message out to them um and thanks for joining us any any final words god save the queen (laughs) you'll rue the day (laughs) 